I'd like to do a reading, um, some excerpts from the book. And I'd like to start at the end of the book, chapter 7. Living the life of a Jivan Mukta, spiritual activism. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Margaret Mead. Jiva means individual soul, and mukta means liberation. A jivan mukta is a liberated soul, one who knows him or herself to be one with all that is. A jivan mukta is a living, liberated being who works to contribute to the liberation of others. An activist is someone who actively works for change. To be spiritual is to feel your connection to all living beings. Spiritual activism is to actively work to further the conscious connection of oneself to others in a positive, life-affirming, mutually beneficial way. To be a spiritual activist is to be activated by spirit rather than a skin-encapsulated ego. To dare to care about the happiness, well-being, and liberation of others is to be a spiritual activist. A Jivan Mukta actively pursues liberation or enlightenment for the benefit of all. The biggest obstacle to our spiritual evolution as a species at this time is our perception and treatment of animals and the natural world. Once we wake up from our sleep of denial and become aware of the truth of our connection to all of life, our spiritual practice, or sadhana, begins. Ecstasy is the true ground of being and it pulsates within you at all times. Recognize it and celebrate it in others, and you will find it in yourself. By not trying to tame, enslave, and exploit others, you allow them the right to pursue their, <coughs> pursue their own natures, and in doing so, you allow yourself the same adventure into bliss. If we are to spiritually evolve, and survive as a species, we must liberate ourselves from the lie that separates us from the rest of life. The world is a reflection of ourselves. By living in harmony with the earth, we can find our way back to our true self. I'm not suggesting we go back to nature. That is not possible, because nature is with us now. It is who we are. Go within to experience the wildness of your own self, that living place of harmony, where true anarchy, self-rule, is the rule. So here I'm speaking to spiritual activists and those who want to make a positive change in the world. Establish your goals. Recognize the potential within yourself to become liberated and for your life to serve as an instrument of liberation for others. Cultivate your vision through infusing yourself with vast compassion. Compassion that extends to include everyone. Never before in our known planetary history or herstory have we as individuals had such potential to decide our eminent future and that of this planet. If we are complacent and do nothing, the world as we know it will shut down. If, on the other hand, we come to our senses and dare to care about the suffering and happiness of others, we will abolish slavery in our lifetime and liberate ourselves from the process. Liberation, or moksha, is the goal of yoga, and ecstasy, or bliss, is its experience. I'd like to read a poem now. Would that be all right?
Adesso leggerà un poema, se per voi va bene. Mm, this poem was inspired by reflecting on my own death and contemplating if I were to die now, would I feel satisfied that I did my best to be as kind as I could and to make some type of a dent in the insanity which is going on in this world today. 52 billion animals are slaughtered for food in the world every year. They're tortured and humiliated and degraded. And at the time of my own death, I must ask myself, did I do enough? Am I satisfied with my contribution to the happiness and liberation of others? And so I wrote this poem. Spiritual activation. <laughs> Angry thoughts disarray the heart, pierce through the deformity with breath as your start. Shatter with a blow or a throw, you could do it inside a wishing well. Where your feelings once fell, if all else fails, embrace it with your holiness, wrapping your everything around using the sound of the breath. What else could be better? Yes, that's it. The face of look upon you. Praying and oming alone cannot do. Sitting at a lotus altar while babies stumble to their slaughter. Nervous laughter holds you back from doing what you ought to. This Armageddon of look upon you is not going to stop. Not even in the forest, even in the shop. Here the bodies go, chop, chop. It has only just begun. Birth is bloody. So many shades of red, she said. You don't know what it's like to be dead. You heard them plotting to do disturbing things. What stopped you from intervening? You are reeling in your obedience to ineffectualness. Afraid? of being humiliated, stepping out of line? Oh, look at that face of look upon you. Guilt paralyzes your mouth. You cannot speak. Lies <coughs> fill your ears, snuffing out the cries. Feet rooted in cement, forgetfulness of who you are. So, what to do? Remember anyway, and say something. Say something, anything. Pierce through the deformity with a voice from the farm and the killing floor. When your own death is closing in, you will realize that the only thing you ever really had in life was your effect upon others. Your end will come as a rattling snake slithering in. As you leave you, you will see that look upon you. You never had time, certainly no time to lose. Your body will stretch toward that last breath, so do your best to see that all that you see is coming from inside of you. Nothing and no one has not been born from inside of you. Pierce through the deformity by means of breathing. Absorb into your rainbow body the pixelation of these phantoms with the embrace of recognition. Allow black and white to collide into colors wondrous fair and go on into the future of not knowing where. In the book, there's a section of frequently asked questions with some possible answers. And so I think we're going to take some random questions here. And then we'd like to hear your questions afterwards. 
I just want to practice yoga for the physical benefits. Why should I be concerned with vegetarianism, the environment, or political activism? What could be more physical than what you eat, where you live, and who you live with? Question. Human beings have always eaten meat. It's natural. Even animals eat other animals. Shouldn't we as yogis try to live a more natural life? Some meat eaters defend meat eating by pointing out that it is natural. In the wild, animals eat one another. True. The animals that end up on our breakfast, lunch, and dinner plates, however, aren't those who normally eat other animals. The animals we exploit for food are not the lions and tigers and bears of the world. We eat the gentle, vegan animals. However, on today's farms, we actually force them to become meat eaters by making them eat feed containing the rendered remains of other animals and fish, which they would never eat in the wild. Lions and other carnivorous animals do eat meat, but that doesn't mean we should. They would die if they didn't eat meat. Human beings, in contrast, choose to eat meat. It isn't a physiological necessity. In fact, we are designed anatomically to be vegetarians. Lions and other carnivorous animals do a lot of things besides eat meat. They live outdoors, not in houses. They don't wear clothes or drive around in cars. Why cite just one of the many things that they do and argue that we should imitate them? That doesn't make much sense. Besides, there are many activities that human beings have been doing forever. We might argue from that perspective that eating meat should be allowed to continue. Men have been raping women for thousands of years. Does that mean that it is normal and should be allowed to continue? No. Human beings came to recognize rape as a crime. Yogis investigate all long-standing habits and behaviors and evaluate them by one criterion. Does this activity bring me or the world closer to enlightenment? It is wise for the yogi to consider that when someone causes harm to another, that action perpetuates the wheel of samsara, the cycle of birth, life, death, the cycle of suffering. The yogi is attempting to be free of samsara and therefore does not eat meat since it creates the type of karma that keeps us bound to the wheel of samsara. I don't eat meat but I eat fish. Is that all right? Isn't it true that fish are cold-blooded and don't feel pain? Answer. Actually, fish are very sensitive creatures with highly developed nervous systems. They feel pain acutely. Number 20. If they weren't able to feel pain, they, like us, could not have survived as a species. Their nervous systems, like ours, secrete <coughs> opiate-like pain-dampening biochemicals in response to pain. Here's an example that may help you understand just how sensitive a fish is. I try to imagine this. If you were a fish and you were to touch a doorknob, you would be able to feel the presence of every person who had touched that doorknob during the course of a day. That's pretty sensitive. Have you seen how fish are able to swim in a school so precisely relating to their fish fellows? and never clumsily bump into one another? That's because they have highly developed sense of feeling in their bodies, which enables them to feel not only the movement of the water against their skin, but the presence of other beings who are close. Fishing is not a benign activity. It is hunting in the water. Fish are complex beings who choose mates, who use words to communicate, build nests, cooperate with one another to find food, have long-term memories, and use tools. At least if we choose to eat fish, it's cleaner for the environment 
and we aren't contributing to the ecological toll that eating beef or pork is causing, right? Wrong. <laughs> Fishing is taking a huge toll on the planet's ecosystem. We are emptying the oceans, seas, lakes, and rivers as we fish them dry. Large factory trawlers indiscriminately scrape and haul up everything from the ocean floor, along with every one unfortunate enough to get caught in the nets. Roughly one-third of what is dragged in is not profitable fish, but other sea animals, including turtles, whales, dolphins, seals, and sea birds. These beings are referred to by the fishing industry as bycatch. Severely traumatized and wounded, these animals are subsequently thrown back into the ocean, dead or dying. None survive. To meet the huge consumer demand for fish, the industry can no longer rely on hunting wild fish. Now we are doing to fish what was done to wild cows, sheep, goats, chickens, and ducks thousands of years ago. We are confining them in holding pens. These floating fish farms, or hatcheries, like their land equivalents, are sites for genetic engineering. They contribute to polluting the ocean with toxic excrement and residue as any other farm would. Many genetically altered fish escape from the confines of the crowded floating concentration camps to mingle and mate with their wild fish cousins, causing horrible and irreversible damage to wild species. Today's fishing industry supplies land farms with fish as well. Now here's what I'm going to tell you next. Not many people know, or at least that's what I've experienced. Over 50% of the fish caught is fed to livestock on factory farms and regular farms. It is an ingredient in the enriched feed meal fed to livestock. <coughs> Farm animals like cows, who by nature are vegans, are routinely force-fed fish, as well as flesh, blood, and manure of other animals. It may take 16 pounds of grain to make one pound of beef, but it also takes 100 pounds of fish to make that one pound of beef. <laughs> 